Welcome to another episode of Ori Lifestyle Inclusive Beauty Podcast. My name is Titi Lolami Bello, and today I have with me Dr. Chidima Akwa and Fumi Akomu. Dr. Chidima, should I let you do the introduction? Introduce yourself, please. All right. So, hello, everyone. Like she has said, my name is Akwa Chidima. I'm a medical doctor, a cosmetic physician, or an aesthetic practitioner. So, pleased to meet you and for me. Yes. For me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fumi Akomu. Um, professionally, I'm a pharmacist, I'm registered, practicing for close to 20 years now. And I think that's the cap I'm wearing here today. Yes, you're certainly wearing your pharmaceutical cap. Um, I especially want you to touch on safety um, when we're talking about this issue today. So today we're diving into cosmetic surgery, um, something that we know is very popular, likely to become more popular. Trends come, trends go, things change. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, it was all about breast augmentation. Um, now things seem to be moving more towards what we call BBL, which is the Brazilian butt lift um, and other surgical procedures. And I really wanted to come at this podcast, not to lecture people on what to do or not what to do, but to inform and educate our audience on how to go about finding the practitioners that will ensure that their health is of paramount uh, consideration when and if they want to go down this route. We know that there are a myriad of reasons why people want to uh, choose cosmetic surgery. And I know that there are some people that take a very, very hard stance against cosmetic surgery. I'm definitely not one of them. I have had one procedure myself. So I definitely am not coming from a point of don't do any surgery. But I have been seeing the rise in plastic surgery. And especially in Nigeria, where I am today, I don't necessarily have any concerns. I also actually wanted to do this podcast to understand what's going on, what's driving some of the changes. And if there are any concerns at all, um, what people should be aware of and note of. So should I pass over to you, Dr. Chiduma? What's driving the rise in cosmetic surgery in Nigeria? And which type of surgery are we seeing more of? Okay, so thank you. I would say um, we can't deny the influence of social media. We cannot. We can't also deny peer influences like okay you've seen someone do it but I believe everyone has a right to beauty so this is increasing because people have realized that in addition to going to the gym dieting well I can still do something about this thing that has changed my appearance it's making me feel a little less confident especially when we're coming from a perspective of after childbirth, mm -hmm. after massive weight gain, weight loss, mm -hmm. or a period of depression. Mm -hmm. There are very valid reasons. So the increase is because people are now realizing that, oh, I can actually do something about this thing in addition to exercise, dieting, and other things. So it's a form of awareness. They are now aware of the empowering benefits of going for cosmetic surgery. I mean, yeah. what, what do you think is driving anything aside from what Dr. Tudema said? I, I think I definitely see all those points and I, I can't dispute them. I would say probably for somebody like me who, if you had asked me maybe 10, 15 years ago, I'd be like, no. But at 40 plus, I, it's not a hard no anymore. It's a, hmm, I would definitely think about this. So I think probably maybe... Um, Things like age, you know, you mentioned um, childbirth yes. and all those kind of things. I think societal pressure, especially mm. for women mm. in particular. I, I don't know the statistics or the numbers, but I don't generally hear a lot of people talking about men going through cosmetic surgery. Probably happens. They do quite a bit, okay. actually. But the focus always seems it's to be around, around women. women. So right. I definitely think 
age, societal pressure mm. probably also adds to it. I, I have to, yeah. I definitely have to say that there is something about females. I mean, absolutely, we are, it, society is hard on us. It's hard on expectation, beauty standards. It's always female, especially as we get older. But you yes. mentioned something about childbirth. And I think I was like you for me. If you had asked me before I had children, I definitely would have said before. No. Not no. necessary. For me, mm-hmm. personally, yes. plastic surgery was not on the horizon. But after I had my children, the thing that took the biggest hit was my breasts. Mm. And I never had, and this is another thing, like when you see images of young, beautiful uh, women, maybe in the early 20s, you always see perky breasts Mm. as Mm. a representative of what beautiful breasts look like, like, youthful breasts. I never actually really had that that perky breasts. Mm. I had small breasts and I was very happy with them because they were small. Um, I could wear any top and it was fantastic. But when I had kids... (laughs) It it was like a deflated balloon, like literally. I I commend your openness about this. No, no, it's it's true. It was like a deflated balloon that you literally could do that and it would drop. And bear in mind that I also, I was exercising. And so I was exercising and I started lifting weights. And I had a toned body Mm -hmm. and I had two deflated balloons. It, it looked like something that what, that belonged to a different body. Mm. And I know that some people will be in a position like mine and go, well, this is the, what do they call it? The warm, well, war marks of having children. The beauty of motherhood. And, and the beauty of motherhood. The aftermaths and, of. Absolutely yeah. right. The, the miracle of life. Absolutely <laughs> right. right. No comment. <laughs> and, and, but I was not prepared to live to with that. To bear those marks. I just was mm. not prepared to bear those marks. What was my option? The only option. You cannot exercise no. to get perky breasts, breasts or to lift your breasts, whatever Instagram tells you, right? Or you, magic oils. Or magic oils. <laughs> Sorry, or can magic I just oils. Throw in a quick caveat. And this is probably in my head. I have been doing a lot of push ups recently. No, push ups. And I feel like mm, I've noticed some difference. Maybe it's only my head. Absolutely not. Chat. It's definitely in your head because I looked at this it's extensively. And if push ups uh, or check because your push up, it does work, work your chest, mm-hmm. but it's not working okay, your yeah. breast because your breast uh, is, a, is a fat tissue. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not a muscle tissue. So it's yes. not going to lift, right? Your yeah. breast. So I decided then that I, I needed to do it for me um I'm really happy my husband was not against it completely when if it's going to make you feel more comfortable go for it and that's what made me that's what made me do it I have not it's over 10 years now no regrets whatsoever no complaints no complaints and no regrets however it was not perfect for me, and this is one of the things that I, I really want people to understand that mm-hmm. cosmetic surgery is not offering you perfection. I don't even believe that there is perfection. But before we kind of delve into that, what are the most popular uh, surgeries yes. in, 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 in Nigeria? Well, okay. Let's pick Lagos, for example. Okay, without thinking too much, liposuction BBL. That's what I read. That is the most common. Okay, then followed by the tummy talk. Mm. You know, there's there's different aspects of aesthetics. Mm. We know the people doing um, Botox. Those ones are quite... But if we're asking surgery, liposuction, BBL, then a tummy talk, then breast lifts. Ah. Or no, lifts Lifts. and reductions before augmentations. People have a lot of breasts that is sagging, dropping... They want the nipple repositions to stand. They want it reduced. Mm. Not everybody with big breasts likes like it. And then they just want it peckier, smaller. Mm. So mm. yes, that's before breast increments. Mm. People are not really keen on breasts being that big here because we already are busty here somehow. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, so can you explain what BBL is? Yeah. Um for our, our listeners and, mm-hmm. and those who are watching. And I asked that question because I only recently 
discovered that it doesn't actually involve implants. So can you explain okay. what it is and how the procedure is carried out? So BBL is the acronym for a Brazilian butt lift. Mm. I believe they called it that because it's originated from that side or the popular providers of the mm. procedure mm. were around the Brazilian, will I say, country so, so, but now a lot of other countries call it their own. For example, they say Dominican butt lifts. I've oh. seen some Nigerian oh, surgeons right. say Nigerian butt lifts. Okay. Okay. Essentially, just okay. means using harvested fat from areas like the belly, arms, back to augment or fill in the hips or the buttocks. Essentially, that is what it is. And after that fat is gotten, it is treated with antibiotics. Okay. Some people pass it through like a centrifuge so that some impurities um, go out of it. Then okay. they mix and treat with antibiotics and then inject it again to give, well, I say harmonized thighs and hips and projection to the butt. Okay. So that is what a BBL essentially stands for. It's meant to achieve volume and contour. Okay. Yes. Okay. But... If I may take you back to where you talked about perfection, people also have to understand that the moment you start going for that perfection, you're likely going to get it wrong mm. somewhere along the line. Mm. For example, I've had liposuction BBL. It's almost four years. I made sure there was nothing excessive about it. I told the surgeon, I, I mean, professional, I do not look, need to look funny. Everything proportionate, nothing too much. Ooh. So... Dr. Chidema, you've actually had yes. liposuction and BBL. Yes. Oh, wow. I, I knew about the liposuction. <laughs> I knew about the liposuction. I did not know about the BBL. You are well versed to talk about these two amazing... Yes, yes, I have. So when you want it to be excessive or looking for it to be overly perfect, it should be subtle. It should be smart. Right. It should be moderate. When it is moderate, that's when we can easily harmonize it. And that's when you won't look too plastic. Okay. I was very happy when you said it wasn't perfect. perfect. It doesn't have to be. Has it met that need? Absolutely. Reasonably? Absolutely. Yes, that's okay. Nothing should be overdone. Oh, fantastic. I'm, I'm glad that How you said How do you that. assess that though? Is that during a process of consultation? Like is the person's body shape taken into account? Yes, the okay. person's body shape. And for Africans that have tougher skin, because this thing, if you're adding something, it should be able to accommodate, expand, little like a balloon. Okay. But for us here, we have very tough connective tissue. So when you're telling someone, oh, you don't have too much space, but let's just do something that will make you look different and okay. So from consultation, from examining the patients, and then when you see those people that they just want too much, they are then if, if you're led, you can just say, oh, maybe I, do, I, I think you need to research more. You refer the person because... They are real, they are, well, I say expectations. Expectations. I get that. Do you know why I get yeah. that so clearly? Um, in the UK, if you want to, or at least in my time, if you want to uh, have surgery, you, they do assess your mental health. Mm -hmm. You may not be told that they're, they're assessing your mental health, but they are assessing your mental health by asking you one or two questions. Mm -hmm. Because I think they're very, very well aware that some people have various forms of dys body dysmorphia yes. where no matter the surgery, it's never going to be enough. They're never going to be satisfied. And those are the sorts of client base that will push the boundaries. Yes. So when you see women with humongous mm. breast implants, they probably most even likely... feelers. And even overdone, fillers. Overdone, overdone, overdone. Absolutely. And to them... That is, that is it. That is how we should look. But to other, <laughs> this is excessive, yeah. but yeah. It, it's important yeah. to assess them. Abs absolutely. absolutely we, I do it by explaining something to you and I'm expecting a level of understanding. If you come back and start asking me those things again, I'll, I'll get it that, oh, it's as if this person didn't understand what I said in mm. that regard, especially when I manage your expectations, bring it down. And the person still sends me a wish pick of something very big. and say, this is how I want it. I begin to, okay. So I see if this person is not 
getting it or getting what I'm saying. So that's how we do it. Or we check the motives or if the person has done one round, two rounds, it's coming back for the third round mm. and you can't see what is wrong. You look good. The first two, you're okay. Yeah. I wouldn't touch anything. If if I had your body, it's perfect, but the person still wants more. Yeah. That's a, a sign That's a to red us signal. that, okay. That's a red flag, as they yes. say. Mm. Yes, this is, there's something else. Fantastic. I remember I, one of the things that you said earlier around um, no perfection and making sure that things are also proportionate to yes. the size or the shape of the person. That really struck me because for me, sometimes the giveaway of a poor BBL is when the thighs don't match the bum. So it, it's really impossible for, well, for most people, unless of course you come for, from certain regions um, and without being disparaging, um, South Africans, for example, genetically tend to have the, that you know, shape. The, the, yes. that shape. But even when you look at them, their thighs often match Tweedy legs and then the big bums. But, you know, we thank you for explaining what BBL is. Um, I once had a friend who was very, very self conscious about her bum, um, always complained about how flat uh, it looked. And I, and I know, you know, that for some people, if they feel that it's a shortcoming of some sort, a BBL might be a thing for them. I will be very honest with you. I've never really understood liposuction, um, the removal of fat from certain parts. Okay. And I think the reason I don't understand it is that it can be achieved with weight loss. So I've never really understood why people opt for that. And I certainly don't understand why people opt for that without changing their lifestyle alongside it. Because the fat does come back, right? Um you would in liposuction some of the fat cells have been removed but oh. the ones that stay back have the ability to still acquire much size and fat so that's why it looks like the fat comes back but the number of cells Everything have been has been yes, reduced by the liposuction but the ones that are left can to an extent if there isn't so much fibrous tissue in those they can still expand so i i like that question i i like the way you framed it and that's why i tell some people this surgery you're doing is a welcome is an initiation into you taking yourself seriously mm -hmm. you can't keep up with this liposuction is not a weight loss procedure it's not it's more of a contouring it's more of a target treatment right it's just too beautiful. And that's why that is what the gymming sometimes doesn't give. They want that contour. They want that tinier waist. I get and you. then a bit of fat to give the feminine silhouette. But that doesn't take away healthy eating, exercise, literally just respecting yourself. Because that's, that's, that's another thing. You have to treat yourself with that respect even to keep the results because that also makes them gain so much weight in that transferred fat and it begins to look disproportionate because as you've put the fat there it will grow it will connect to blood supply and begin to grow and then you're still eating pizza you're not exercising in any way you don't even fast on some days and there's nothing doing you're not dealing with children or childbirth this is a young somebody in their 20s nothing they just don't care about this. You would, you would look funny. Even the surgery requires you to be moderate in feeding, exercise, keep toned. Fantastic. So I, I also say it to people and I'm happy after surgery when I scroll statuses and I see them exercise. I'm yeah, that's it. The one we did is okay, but this is how you maintain it yes That's this fantastic. is how you you won't start looking funny because we're women women everything will sag drop expand lose will i say tensile strength with time yes exercise is a plus it's not even debatable yes whether you did bbl or not absolutely yeah, so i share that thought with you coming without changing your lifestyle is just Fantastic. I, I yeah. think that you've um, really expand, uh, expansiated and clarified one thing, which mm -hmm. I think is true. Um, exercising, even weightlifting, as much as it can help change your body shape, cannot address certain things like 
uh, cur- putting curves Contour, in the right places yes. or removing fat from s- certain spaces. So mm-hmm. that may be where uh, surgery can help some people if they have a particular look that they mm-hmm. want to achieve. It yeah. seems to me, however, that Lagos at the moment, and I know this can't be true, but the perception from what we can see seems to be overflowing with BBLs. <laughs> How much is this thing costing? Because <laughs> I, I need to Everyone's know. Everyone's doing it. Okay, so, um, you know, the Forex, foreign exchange is not even making things easier. But from last year, you could get liposuction BBL anywhere from 2.5 to 3.5. Now, some clinics, by the time you're done with all you need and your supplies and massages, you would have spent up to five. Five, five million. Yes. Million naira, to which is surgery. in pounds. Okay. Pounds is like one nine or two thousand. Okay. So we're just talking about under three thousand pounds. Yeah. So under three thousand pounds for BBL alone. Liposuction BBL. Oh, so liposuction and BBL. Yes. Okay. Lipo oh, because brings you the bring fat, the fat yes. and then BBL then BBL uses then it too. So about three thousand pounds. Yeah. Do you think that that is what is enticing some people to come to Nigeria? Because we also know that there is now a growing mm-hmm. plastic surgery tourism yes. where people are coming from. Yes. The abroad, as yes. you say, into Lagos to have their plastic surgery. Is the cost a part of the factor? What other reasons okay. are there? For some people, the cost is, for them, by the time they exchange, it's about, like we said, 3,000 pounds and it's easily reachable for them. Even dollars, it's maybe 4,000, yeah. 5,000 dollars. And that's okay. Okay. But for Nigerians, they... They say that there's, will I say, cheap labor here. Uh, not, ju- not, the surgery. not the surgery. Not just surgery. In the sense of support. Abroad, when people have CSEs or give birth, you find out you're by yourself, you're doing things yourself. But here, you can have nannies, you have support, you have people waiting on you, you have people helping you. The recovery is generally easier for you here. And then there is something that... I don't even know if I should say here, but I've had a patient tell me that, oh, I'm not going to all those places to go and do my surgery. What if something happens to me? Why do I stress my family moving? Oh, so they're at home if anything goes wrong. If anything goes wrong, they are home. And it's not even like anything goes wrong, like wrong, wrong, final. They are home. They're not stressing anybody to fly in. As in if they die. Mm, They're not stressing. Someone said to me, please, let me stay around here. So if anything happens, nobody is stressed. All we need is like good boss going somewhere. (laughs) So there's that too. But first, first, like you said, it is reachable for them financially. There is more support here when you're recovering. And then that's stressing the family. And then again, we understand how an African woman wants to look. Oh, okay. So, okay. So that is actually... Yeah, some people will be like, I know they are about safety and they don't want to go more than this certain liters. They don't want to do this. They don't want to stretch this. But for Nigerian surgeons or providers, surgery providers, we know how to stretch it a bit within the safety limits and give results so some people say that i went to this place everything was i was just looking like a white woman i meant to and i had the potential to look more curvy they just did it up up like that so i want it to be properly done i want the proportions i want you to take out the fast you can take without telling me there's limit of this or that so it's just like they're trying to boycott those safety things put in the will i say other countries but it's because we are willing to give them those results, stretch it a bit, push it a bit to give them results. And that's where I want to bring you in, uh, Fumi, because I I think I'm hearing two things from what you just said now. Mm. The first is, yes, traditionally or historically, we've had a particular physique that we greatly admire. And it's not been the thin, straight up, straight down physique. It's always been the curvier Mm -hmm. physique that... The Africans have always kind of celebrated. Um, so there's that. Working with a surgeon that understand the aesthetics that you like. But there's something, but in doing that, there's something that you also raised around safety. 
pushing the safety. Do you want to come in yeah. um, on that? That's actually quite interesting. And I'll tag on to the both points. There's something where when we're working, there's a scope of practice based on experience. And I've said this to you in the past, you know, go to a dermatologist who understands dark skin or go to um, a practitioner who has experience in dealing with this particular type of issues. And so I can completely agree with that um, sentiment of wanting to be in an environment where the surgeons understand um, an African woman's body. Um, they can see that. When it comes to safety, obviously, scope of safety always has a range. And there is something that we call um, medical discretion or clinical discretion. So you do expect a clinician, whether it's a doctor or a surgeon, to be able to make certain professional judgments. That doesn't take them out of a safety scope. What it is saying is that they have enough knowledge, enough experience to be able to make a call on an individual patient. So it's not necessarily that they're going outside of a safety model. It's that they're sitting in front of somebody, they're assessing that individual and they're saying, actually, we can do this. We can go a step further because I've assessed that this particular individual is able to, their body is able to accommodate that or their um, factors that have been put in place to mitigate any kind of issues. And Dr. Tudiman, that's exactly what you were alluding to. Even earlier when you spoke about uh, the, was it the skin that was, that has yeah. a, to is stretch. a bit tougher, tougher to stretch? Tissue, so so yes. if, if a surgeon that deals a lot with black women knows that, then they know that they can maybe move within that safety, safety scope yes. a little bit more. But if a surgeon who is not so familiar or experienced with, he may not realize, it, it, am I right? If, in, in, if he realizes, he may not be willing to do it. Let right. me just, and okay. people have spent, so to say, thousands of dollars and then they come out and they feel like nothing was done. And on the part of the surgeon, he's like, I'm being safe. I'm, mm. I'm not stretching past, past this. That. I'm not going past this set point. So we try to marry that satisfaction with, in terms of results and pushing the edge of safety and that's what some women come back or some of our clients come back for. They know, oh, yes, they will be safe, but they will do it the way I'm meant to look. Oh, I want yes. to look. Yes. I'm so, actually quite impressed because I think, you know, and this is probably completely wrong mindset. Um, I don't think I've ever considered the fact that in Nigeria, you know, practitioners are actually thinking along those lines because that is actually showing that they are thinking about safety. They are um, not just, it's not just the money making, you know, you get these pictures being painted about mm. cosmetic surgery is big in Nigeria because of the money, but it's actually providing mm. a service that is specific Absolutely. to the population. Absolutely. And desired. Ha and desired. That's, that's, that's the right, right one. But, but, but I don't, I don't want us to move away from safety yet because I, I am still, uh, I still want us to explore some of the concerns around safety. And I think that some of it may be legitimate, but when I talk about it now, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to kind of assume that I'm making a point that there is a safety issue here that is not anywhere else. In other places, yeah. Um, how, I've heard particularly that BBL, a lot of surgeons have said they wouldn't do it. Okay. In fact, we had Dr. Awudu here uh, who was talking to us about a Zempic, a weight loss mm -hmm. drug um, and skincare. And he's on record somewhere else as saying mm -hmm. it is one of the most dangerous procedures um, uh, in the world. Um, what is your take first on it being particularly dangerous? Okay. And then what is your take on uh, the safety aspects of it um across the world but most especially where we are Stuch in Nigeria. yeah all right so um let me educate or explain more on why bbl can be seen as one of the most dangerous mm. now let's bear in mind the societal stigma 
the dramatization of it, the belief that this is done for vanity, because you can't tell me that this is more dangerous than open heart surgery or brain surgery. But open heart is for saving lives. So that was a serious issue. But because this one concerns beauty, that is why we are saying it, it can't be more dangerous than those. There are serious surgeries that take hours upon hours. And even the patients are told, we may or may not see you. It's 50-50. But, those, it's, but, but, it's, but it's somebody not, listening to this will may say, but those are needed. Are needed, to, yeah. To, for I you, said... For, to, for you, yes. For you to stay alive. Yes. Those those are, will I call it, at that point, life determining or so. Compared to someone who really wasn't ill and just decided, oh, I want to do this yeah. for aesthetic yeah. reasons. Yeah. So I get that, will I say, I get the stigma and like I said in one of our previous discussions before this podcast, the stigma affects everyone, even the providers of the surgery or of the services. So coming to why he said it is dangerous is because when you are grafting fat, there is the skin, there is the fat layer, there is muscle. In that muscle, in the bum, you have blood vessels as big as this lumen, or as big as this, the caliber is big. And these blood vessels are going back to the heart or supplying the lower limb. And we know how important the legs are. Now you are transferring fat and you mistakenly leave all the fat areas, go beneath the muzzle, hit that vessel and shoot like how many meals of fat into it. What you have created is a fat embolism. Mm. When something embolizes, it is moving. So now the blood carries that fat all the way to the heart. The heart pumps it to the lungs. Mm. And the lung is meant to be somewhere that exchanges oxygen, carbon mm. monoxide, blood. The, the, the membranes there are between gases and liquid, the blood. Mm. And now fat is in there coating and covering everything and that's why the person may find it difficult to breathe end up in icu and we call that a fat embolism somewhere that should be just an a water air mm. interface you now added a film of oil that is what and i explain this to every single patient i come across what can be done to avoid that mm -hmm. first of all in a woman a normal african woman that is voluptuous it means you have more fat thickness of fat you stay in that fat. When you go past skin and the first fissure, you will know it's it's more about clinical acumen. You will know when you're in fat. You should know when you're in muscle. And there are danger areas or zones of the buttocks that if you're in this area, you should be as superficial as possible so that you do not hit a vessel. Okay, say you do not want to do any of these things by mere clinical acumen or just mm -hmm. the way you are feeling and touching mm -hmm. things. There is ultrasound right. that can guide you and say, this is the depth of this person's fat. Now, when somebody is flat, flat, you know, they don't have, they maybe the, more, the fat layer is this slim and you know, the, you now have to be careful. During fat transfer, once you come in contact with muzzle, it switches. So there's high That's clinical the acumen. There's, there's a high safety index required to do this. Stay beneath, stay in the fatty tissue, just beneath the skin. And that's why it's important that you ask about experience in Absolutely. knowing the safe places. For example, when people come to CGE, I want to do this. What is the name of the surgeon that will be doing this with the team? And I give them all the names, but in the end, they're like, you'll be there, Abby. I'm like, yes, I'll be there. Do you understand? So it's experience seeing, well, I say hundreds, I, I won't say thousands yet. For me, seeing hundreds of these things being done and then working with each patient, somebody that is flat, flat, you know that the fat layer is small. That's not someone you're trying to put 1,000 meals of fat, fat. Mm -hmm. and the skin is not expanding because you know you will hit, you could hit muzzle, you could go beneath that muzzle to give more volume. And chances of hitting a blood vessel is there. But when in doubt, then get equipment like ultrasound. And if you're still not sure, just do the safe one and tell the patient, oh, we couldn't go past this. Right. It's as simple as that. We couldn't go past this. You have a very thin layer or area that we can walk around with. 
your skin is tight. And you know, again, if you over inject because you're trying to project, the fat will die mm. and lead mm. to fat necrosis. Mm. So these are the issues around it. And that thing means in the cosmetic surgery industry, it is the most dangerous procedure. Right. That is what it means. Not in all surgeries. But people like, so oh, it's the most dangerous in the whole wide world. No, it's just in our field. That is the most dangerous procedure that can be done because it requires a very high index of experience and safety. And then I respect patients that say, oh, don't transfer nothing. I'm good. Thank you. That is... And I'll tell you, sure... You sure you won't regret this? And because now you'll be saying, I wanted, I don't want anything. I just want the fat out. Don't transfer. That's, that's, that's an good. option. That's great as well. So, what I've heard from you very, very loud and clear it is very, very important to make sure that you pick a surgeon that has experience in the specific cosmetic yes. su uh, surgery that you're going for. And that may be that a plastic surgeon may have a lot of experience with breast implants, but not necessarily, right? With, there's, with there's mastery. You have to look. Mm -hmm. You can go to someone that's posting breasts only and say, oh, I want to do BBL. Oh, I Perfect. want... They, they may be trained in all of those things, everything, but there's mastery. There's people that do this particular thing and they are good at it. They could do it in their sleep. You wake them up and they know, do you understand? So it's good to, even there are categorized now, if you're looking for BBLs, if you're looking for tummy talks, or this person's strength, one, two, three, this, this, this. Fantastic. So, kind of yeah. happens in most surgical cases. Like mm -hmm. when I was mm -hmm. looking at surgery, you know, for fibroids, you know, somewhere like the UK, every surgeon has to have their area of speciality. So you have those who say, well, this is the kind of size that I've gone up to mm -hmm. in my experience. And then you have those who say, yes, I deal with bigger sizes. Mm -hmm. I've, um, you know, so I think you make a very valid point. And for any individual considering it, those are some of the things, things that, that you, you need have to, to be think thinking about. about. Yeah. Great. In terms of safety, um, you're right. In our prior conversation, you really stressed the point that no surgery is safe. I think everyone really needs to remember that, that mm, no yeah. surgery is safe. Risk-free. Or risk-free. Yeah. yeah. However, I have heard of at least two BBL-related deaths in recent years in Nigeria. Um not too long ago, even um, in 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 this country, what are some of the safety uh, measures that are sound that are in place that can help people navigate this? What is regulation like in this area? Maybe let's take people actually dying, because I don't think people realize that they could die. Isn't that part of consenting? Any surgery it's all lists there. death. As yeah. a risk. Yeah, I had a patient who counted the number of times deaths appeared in our consent, consent form. Forms. I think she said 20 something times. I said, yes, we have to let you know because medicine is very, well, I say dynamic, unpredictable. And the human body, if I may veer a bit from speaking like a scientist, my mother would say, there's nothing holding somebody, meaning that. Something very, will I say, minor, maybe too stressful for you. Things that people are coming and mm. going in and out, easy peasy. For some people, it is, they can't stand it. Their system just can't stand it or didn't anticipate that stress. So there are different, will I say, body systems, idiosyncrasies and responses mm -hmm. to the trauma and stress of surgery. It doesn't necessarily mean that something was done wrong. Sometimes that, that may have been the case. We'll leave mm -hmm. it to investigation and regulatory bodies. But you were asking about what regulation is like. So every practitioner, doctor, medical here is under the Medical Dental Council. There are other bodies like the Nigerian Medical Association. There are governing bodies that keep everybody's practice, well, I say straight and in shape. You know, you have this membership with them. And the onus is on you to do the right thing for the patient. First, do no harm. So that's for practitioners. Then for plastic surgeons, they have their own body. 
That is the Nigerian Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgeons, NAPRAS. Most of them are under it. But on the website, you may search a surgeon and you may not see their name there. It doesn't mean they are not fully qualified or trained. It may be the website is not yet updated. It, it may just be one of those things or maybe they are not yet members. But I think graduating or finishing here makes you automatically a member. But sometimes if you don't see the name, you can ask. The surgeon should be able to say, oh, this, 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 or this is the reason why you can't see my name or yes, I'm fully qualified and I have experience. And as you're listening, you know that this person is not fluffing or lying mm. to you. So there's that for the surgeons. Then there are other bodies that regulate facilities because you could have people that are actual surgeons, mm. but the places where they are operating out of mm. is not up to standard. Mm. So when you come to that level of regulation, you have the health and facility monitoring um, and management agency mm. that goes around to check, accredit, give you a certificate. And there are like four other bodies you have to keep up with for that accreditation to remain intact. Mm. The local government around you has to know. The waste management, now there's medical waste, they have right. to know. There's fire safety and fire service. So somebody may have all the certificate and, and just do something in a corner. That is not safe too. Right. The facility has to be safe. Right. So there, there's also another um, new association for aesthetic practitioners. That's the APSMAN Association of Practitioners of Aesthetic Medicine in Nigeria. So as awareness to these things continues to happen, Regulatory bodies and measures are springing up. So yeah. the onus is on providers to make sure that you fulfill or not. And for bodies like the health facility, you have to be in good standing. I had to get a certificate of good standing from the medical and dental council to say, oh, oh, this person can run a facility. And then they came and said, oh, everything is okay. Down to the nylons in the dustbin. Mm. So there's regulatory regulation at different levels. And for the surgeons that come to work with us, they also had to submit their West African certificates. That's evidence of them being surgeons right. and all. So that is, what I say, the minimum mm. that anybody running an aesthetic practice should be able to show. This is my certificate. This is my number. I am accredited. This place has been said it's safe. That is the minimum before we now start to deal with, you know, people's bodies, the differences. Yeah. Can, can, can I just say something from a consumer point of view? Because I think a lot of people may overlook how human beings operate and work. Mm -hmm. There is almost a sort of bias that nothing bad is going to happen to us if we elect or opt for. And I, I because I hear it all the time from medical practitioners. All the risk has been explained. The risk, And I'm not doubting that. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly think it ought to be, and that's one of the reasons I'm stressing it, mm -hmm. that nothing is risk-free and there is a possibility of death even with any cosmetic or even procedure outside of cosmetic surgery. But what I want to kind of offer is that a lot of people see that but don't necessarily internalize it because we think it's very hard for us to deal with our mortality even outside of surgery, let alone think that something that we have chosen is going to lead to our death. So in that, if we, if we kind of accept that, then the, what gives consumers confidence is in strong and effective regulation. And this is not necessarily just about Nigeria. This is worldwide in us having, being confident that there is or there are bodies that are holding people to account and not just in making sure that things don't go wrong, mm -hmm. but in making sure that when things do go wrong, that we learn from it because we're transparent enough to want to investigate, learn, mm -hmm. and then share that learning. I think some of the concerns that I've hearing from certain people is that that transparency is not always in easy. easy easy for, for, for consumers to find. stigma. Mm -hmm. 
the stigma and then unfortunately someone close to you has done this and something happened and the person didn't make it. Most families do not want. Do you even think people tell their family when they go for cosmetic surgery? I think that's more my thought about it or yeah, inexperience. People, a lot people, of people are not open. They don't no, tell. Not a lot. Some people so, are not open, but a lot of people tell. They tell their they family. They tell their partners. Okay. They tell, okay. Some tell their parents. Some come with their significant other, even if not yet husband. They come mm-hmm. with they come with siblings. They come with, yes, they tell. They do expose, but some people will come and be like, this man will never allow me to do this thing. Yeah. We'll be like, we understand, we see you, but we need a minimum of three nest of kings. People oh, that can be three. called. Three. I don't think mm-hmm. that's a requirement in the UK. Okay. Three. And it's important to have three contacts so that peradventure you don't reach the first person, you have another person to call. Peradventure that person you have and it would take village people not to reach any of those three contacts. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yes, three. Mm. And then we try our best to sound it. But still, this is something people have done with high hopes of slaying, looking Absolutely. good. So they will not internalize that. Absolutely. Because it's an emotional thing and you're thinking about they, they the results as opposed that. to what might go so are wrong. Are we saying that the scale of responsibility mm-hmm. on the practitioners is even more? Because you then have to be making even more judgment calls and saying no to certain people in certain yes. cases. Recently, no is my favorite word. For patients, we have people that fly in all the way, book tickets to come in, like paying in pounds. And once you're scanned, a heart scan is mandatory for all our patients, regardless of age. And since we started, we have we have seen unbelievable things. Things you expect should be in older people. You have people 22, 23. Oh, wow. They already have heart-related changes to a lot of things. So... Since we started doing that heart scan, that is like a cutoff for us. If there's anything, we will let you know, oh, based on this, we do not think you can go ahead with your procedure. And it's not it's not the end of the world. You could still achieve this with dietiness. We refer you to the alternative options. Mm-hmm. That You can't take full consent without telling the person, if you won't want to do this, these are the other options. So when we tell them, and despite the pleading and begging, We stand our foot down. I have people that be, okay, refund me. I refund in full. And under the refund screenshot, they are still begging, please. I came all the way to do this. That is not the issue. If anything happens at that point, the responsibility is no more. It is on the practitioner, the clinic. So what about the what about practitioners that are not? There's unscrupulous? always somebody that's going to do it. But but but, but, but and and you could uh, some people. The perception is that where regulation is not tight. tight. And, mm-hmm. and I will be honest with you: people believe that regulation is not tight in this Here in, in this environment. Mm. What are the and I and I'll tell you why some people think that. You can go, for example, on the GMC's register mm-hmm. and you can see doctors that have been struck off mm-hmm. for malpractices mm-hmm. and yeah. wrongdoings. Um, and they are not a reflection of all the doctors in the UK. You know, mm-hmm. they are just a minority, mm-hmm. thankfully. If that is not here, that is a lack of transparency because there cannot be a country where every, all the doctors And it will be hard to convince people that there's regulation when there's no tangible okay. or visible evidence of it. Ideally, most times when we talk about the Nigerian, but I say sphere and scope of mm-hmm. everything, there's this, how do I put it? It's not as if we do not know how to do things expressly right, but there's mm. there are these gray lines mm. I can't explain. But me in the industry, mm. I am feeling the pressure of okay. the regulation. Okay, okay. Which we is are fe- we I've are heard feeling that, the pressure. But the public you, you, is not saying you that. They're not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they are, you That's dare not. Very interesting. Yeah. You dare not. Oh God, we are feeling the pressure of it, and that's why I said because mm. of it, some practitioners don't want to have anything to do with, you know, coming out this open, even if it's educative on podcasts, they don't want, we're feeling the pressure. Okay. And many times, you know, with the way people compare work environments in Nigeria and outside, 
Some people can just wake up and say, oh, here's a letter. Why were you talking on that podcast? So we are under pressure to do the right thing. It may seem like everybody is going, but if you sub submit yourself, there are people running facilities that they've not gone through the stress of getting it accredited. Accredited. Mm. But if you will submit yourself, who doesn't give stress? Even the medical loma, they will come. Why is this in the red carton? Why is, if you submit yourself to that regulation, you will feel it. You will know that, ah, I can't do rubbish. Oh. I have people that can come here and lock up this place. Ah, ah. I have people that can write me a letter tomorrow. But I know there are people that have not taken, they are just in their corner doing yeah. their thing yeah. on a low. But if as a practitioner, you want to get it right, you do the, Right things, submit yourself to the governing bodies, the regulati regulatory bodies, you will feel the pressure. It won't even be difficult to say no to patients. You will easily say, oh, I don't think this is right. You know what? We're postponing your procedure for now. Oh, we can't go ahead. We'll cancel. I think you should travel back and maybe come back another time. Or if you're not meeting up with the timeline of your scans and you're saying, I have to do this now so I can go back now. Be like, I, I don't think you're prepared. Mm. You know what? Go back. So I, I think it's also mm. on us to submit to these regulatory bodies, do things the right way. You find out that it's not hard because any of them, Nigeria, even the people driving buses, you see all those people chasing them. I don't know whether they are chasing them, marking something and giving them. It's the same way. There are several regulatory bodies just for you to... Toe the line. Yes. And then okay. tell your patients that I open up on all those things. Tell them that, oh, there are things we can do. It's not about begging. Okay. It's not about saying, yeah, so we are not yet there for different, what I say, cultural, you know. I understand the laxity, the seeming lack of transparency. Mm. There's no website where you can check. Yes. There are small, small pages and blogs yeah. that kind of share this information, even though sometimes you can't rely on all they say. But if anybody wants to consider this from the diaspora, mm -hmm. I would say just take your time. Give it a three to six months search. By the time you follow one or two pages, the Instagram or whatever social media algorithm will adjust you to all other pages. It is now a personal research. You will take your time and don't be afraid to ask questions. People ask me, okay, where in terms of your career, where is this? Okay, so who will be there during my surgery? Who are the other people there? And after I open up like that and say, oh, these are the people we work with. These are the surgeons. This is the team of anesthetists. They will now be like, hope you will be there. And despite all those people being there, they'll be like, where's Dr. Dimma? Inside the theater, because it's a weak lipo for safety reasons. Where is Dr. Dimma? I think at that point, it's because of that transparency. It's because of telling them everything, I believe. Mm. I, I was as open as possible. So if you're in doubt, spend some time researching. Some people will search. There's no clinic without a story. Right. Some people will search. Say, oh, we saw this about your clinic. What happened? The onus is on me to answer you as truthfully as possible, especially for things that, oh, a statement was released or something. I can copy those links and send to you. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. So you always see dirt on each clinic, no matter how sanctimonious they appear. You will see international and national. There will be disgruntled patients. There will be unhappy patients. Mm -hmm. There will be... You get so there'll be deaths because that's another thing that we ought to talk about. That just because so, somebody dies, um, unfortunately, at a table sometimes doesn't mean necessarily that the surgeon was at fault. It, or, it doesn't or, make it a murder case. But I'm not saying that we can't probe and ask questions and say, well, what really happened? I think sometimes that's yeah. the thing, though. Yeah. I don't get the impression that there's a lot of post. Um, incident information that comes out and maybe that's also the aspect where you know mm. you and your it's practitioners i know it's not easy but i think families stigma in, no i mean i mean this information saying things like you know these are the kind of things that can go wrong you mentioned something now about it's open so they're awake Yes. During the procedure. Yes. So it's under general anesthesia. No, it's regional. This it's time. regional. Ah. Yes. So risk of things like anesthesia, risk of... Reduced. Exactly. So yes. that is reduced. So in actual fact, 
It definitely isn't mm. the most dangerous surgery because oh, no, I think I'm, a lot I'm of people currently. will say for different reasons. <laughs> no, because I've just heard that. it. I've not heard. I've heard it for more than one mm-hmm. surgery. I actually didn't know that I, you I've don't heard, do it under GA. I've, so I, it's never under some GA. Some people do under GA. Okay. It's bougie to the patients. It's like you slept for five minutes, and for us, five hours have passed. We've been at it. Yes. Yes. So yeah. it's bougie, but I found out that if the regional anesthesia is safe for a pregnant woman and child, it's the safest. The patient is conversing. If they feel some type of way, they let you know. You don't have to deal with the effects of those anesthetic gases and it's I would never operate sometimes. on the GA uh, on the no local. I would never on the See, on the local. I'd be the mm-hmm. opposite. I would never because I think GA is one of the high risk parts of a surgery. You know, for and anesthesia, that's experience. the awake is. I I, 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 less I just wouldn't I don't want to Know what you're doing I don't want to see <laughs> it I don't want to hear it just No you're screened Wake me And there's light sedation I don't <laughs> care I just want to go to sleep You can have you music play. I want to go you to can bed have music Wake up you And I want a nice something. round bum You could be watching a movie up. I don't I know. I'm not interested in all of that I understand But but, for but, but you do make You do mm-hmm. make a very good point About post analysis And I, I suppose This is hopefully where regulation here will get to where there is no blame it doesn't start with a blame culture mm-hmm. it starts with wanting to understand and what learn. went wrong and okay. learn the blame culture I think stems a lot out of that sense of people feel things are swept under the carpet so people don't get answers there's no mm-hmm. duty of candor sorry I'm throwing in maybe mm-hmm. a bit of jargon I understand because the more there is a duty to the patient to make them understand mm-hmm. what has gone wrong the more there is confidence this time around to the deceased f- to, to family, family yes. to next there's of that king. duty straightforward yeah but others may feel things are swept under the carpet remember the doctor has sworn or practitioner has sworn a note of confidentiality so yes to the family yeah, but to the public yeah not so much and that still makes people feel so what happened so what happened <laughs> do you yeah. understand so yeah. it is I don't know it's tricky but I've been trying to interject and say there are a couple of research works or projects I'm working mm-hmm. on what do people want to be educated on mm-hmm. what can we what are the lessons we can learn from case studies and it hasn't been so easy for me to say well, I'm putting together this case and I want to do a systemic review and say oh this is what went wrong or this is what we should learn it hasn't been I've had different meetings with my research team about it I would Take that step and let's see mm. what comes out of it. Like I said, sometimes the stigma affects even the providers. They don't want to talk. They don't want to be seen as, but if we don't educate, if we're not bold enough to say, oh, this is how, or this is what, or this is what people should know, maybe things will still remain like this. Yeah. People will For still me, keep you, feeling did, like did this. Did you hear about so, the lady who unfortunately lost, lost her life during a BBL um, about a month ago? Here in Nigeria? Yeah. No, I didn't. Okay. Okay. And I think when that story broke, I think a lot of people heard about it. But mm. when that story broke, one of the things that was said then was that she had gone in for completely different operations and nobody... The, so that's the, what I'm saying. There was an, uh, yeah, no... but, but, but I suppose with that, it wasn't... It's not the medical... That it's on the other side. That's why I mentioned side. about people so don't even say that they go into. So her this. family had said that it was a fibroid operation when it was actually a BBL. Actually, maybe I've heard this story. Yeah, when it was well, actually... I heard it as a fibroid Okay, yes, yeah, so yeah, as a fibroid yeah. situation, but it was actually a BBL. Um, and we don't know what happened, and, you know, but you see, the problem is with that is people don't know what happened and then, but they make the assumption mm. that the surgeon did something wrong, wrong. Um, where it could have been a number of things, including you said something earlier, you do your scan or your pre-op assessment mm-hmm. and you find out that there's a reason that that person shouldn't do it. Um, and I don't know, you know, some characters can be strong. I, I'm not speculating on what happened here. I'm just sort of saying these mm-hmm. are some of the scenarios that people can find themselves in. And I'm actually bringing this up to make another point that we must respect medical uh, decisions or advice. If you've been told that you can't do an operation because you have high blood pressure, 
for example, and it's too that high. That is not controlled. That is not controlled. Mm-hmm. That's that's the right one because yeah. I've I've been in that situation where where I have I've, patients snapping there each morning, morning, evening. I expect to see your blood pressure snap because when you say documents, oh, you could just wake up and forge those things. But when you snap it morning, night, and send to me, both of us are regulating because you can fly in all the way and. We will say no surgery. Yes. And so, I've, yes. I've been denied surgery to actually do it. Gynae issues because my blood pressure was just not, the, 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 the surgeon wasn't going to take the risk. So I understand mm-hmm. that. But I don't know whether patients actually understand that because a patient might say it's just high blood pressure. Oh, well. So where do, we sit in, <laughs> where do we sit in the frame of the, the option for a second opinion? Because there, okay. there's also that, you know, patients are entitled to a a second opinion. So if somebody has come to you, um, you've assessed the situation Mm -hmm. and you've said no. Okay. And I then say, oh, I'm going to go for a second opinion. That's okay. (laughs) But you see... That's okay, sincerely. But you see, there's a danger. Sometimes there's a danger. I mean, this is where we go back to regulation. So it depends on the patients and their... Well, I said demeanor at that time because we had refunded the patient. The patient said, rubbish, I'm going to go and do it in Enugu. I, I was like, okay. For that kind of person, I have no words. Yes. For me, it's it's, it's okay. Yeah, you, you can, you, you're taking you a risk. And for me to refund you and say, please go home. And this person may have maybe three, four children. Go home and you're telling me, oh, please, give me the money, I'm going somewhere. But if somebody is downcast at that time, I'll sit beside you and say, I know what it feels like to have had this expectation, to be looking forward to yourself Mm. in this shape and you are feeling this bad. But let me tell you, if anything goes wrong, you're a young mother of so, so, so. There is more to this than just getting this done. And... I do not even think it is completely bye-bye for now. It just means get this blood pressure under control. And then Go come and back. treat this diabetes. Let an endocrinology give you a go-ahead on this thyroid. Let's for, there's always a way around it. Let someone else, don't be in a hurry. But we, we also know that some months. patients will push the boundaries. And we actually have a high-profile experience of that with an ex-president's um, uh, a wife, wife from this country who was told in England that she oh, couldn't, that have, she like couldn't have a particular uh, a cosmetic surgery and then who flew to, I can't remember the country that she flew to and then had it done and then died. Uh, so we know that there are some patients that they will look for a second opinion that suits their own aim. I've been in this situation before, actually, I should probably mm-hmm. say. So when I had both kids... <laughs> Kids do a number on your body. When I had, you know, so apart from the boobs, which was easy to, it was actually relatively easy to correct with all the risk. But my tummy area, I had what you call a muscle separation in Mm. layman's word, where it was in my, my muscles really stretched. That's, that's waxing. Absolutely. To the point where if I had a drink of water, it would look like I was three months pregnant. It was bloating. that bad. Um, the NHS in England offered me uh, a, a, a sort of surgery because they felt that it, if I left it, it mm-hmm. could develop into a hernia. Yes. And, 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 and they offered me a surgery. But the surgery that they offered me would give me a horizontal... Incision. Lo- in, yes. Um, and, you know... I was in my, then in my... What, still wanted to wear bikinis. I still wanted to wear my bikinis. And I didn't even mind the line, but I knew that under the NHS, it was going to be an ugly one. Mm-hmm. So, I, so, so it was a no for me. And I started researching the other options. My issue wasn't about fat in that area. My issue was the muscle separation and then how it aesthetically looked Looks. and how it was making me look. So I went to a plastic surgeon Mm -hmm. because my research said a tummy tuck Mm -hmm. because during the process of a tummy tuck, a lot of people think that a tummy tuck is just taking fat out, but during the process of a tummy tuck, they also reconstruct 
the muscles so they bring them back yes. together and transplant the umbilicus exactly. drip and cut off his skin exactly so it looks tighter it mm-hmm. was the most aesthetically beautiful result that i could get this is where you know the diet and whatever mantra doesn't always work well, because it wasn't going to be fixed by diet it wasn't going to be fixed by exercise, exercise. it needed that sur- the, the the tummy tuck so i went to the first surgeon first surgeon said fine yes typical problem let me look at you looked at me did the assessment, said, you don't have enough fat. You don't have enough fat for us to do the procedure. Yes, you have the muscle, whatever. And yes, it's actually Mm. really bad. But if I put you on, you don't have enough fat. I can't do it. I was Mm -hmm. heartbroken. heartbroken. Um, I say, that's your opinion. I'm going for a second opinion. I'm going for a second opinion. I went for a second opinion. Strangely. The surgeon said, looked at me, looked at me, did this, said, mm-hmm. okay, I will do it. And then called me back about a week after and said, I've reviewed it and you don't have enough fat. Two doctors, two surgeons saying the same thing was enough for me to say, this is it. Like, and that procedure has, I'm, I'm, I've never explored it again. What did I do? And diet and exercise It is not perfect I've had to It has improved Over years mm-hmm. Yes um, So it's taken 10 years It's it's okay I'm, I'm, I can live with it now mm-hmm. Would I have had the surgery If I could have done it? Absolutely Would my tummy So you'd have done it If somebody said yes I would no, have if, done it If somebody said If, if with the good risk reason. wasn't there yes. yes No but if somebody had said You don't have enough fat But mm. I think I can do it. We can find a way around it. No, I wouldn't have done it. Because well, that's not also after the second opinion. Yeah, after not first, after it the, was likely egg. because people have different approaches, but not after the, the second two, opinion. Second not one. after two people yes. said exactly the so, same thing. As we said that we we don't want to do this and the lady said, oh, I'll go somewhere else. We'll leave you. Chances are, if those people do due diligence mm-hmm. to check, check, they will find the what same we issues. found and the answer will be the same. But some people, you see, they are just, you know, they want it to quickly you brush them in. They are ready. They pay in full immediately. They do everything. And you can just be like, ah, let's go. We're now very careful. And sometimes that is another reason. One of the four reasons I gave why people come. They may have been told uh, no. no somewhere else. Yeah. And they come and yeah. they're expecting an easy yes. You give them a bill, it's almost 10 million. They're happy to pay. Yeah. And they put you through the process. You will scan. You will do a lot of things. Yeah. And if any of these things don't check out, chances are we will say no. So people have, I, I've had surgeons here in this, and that's why I'm saying, ah, this regulation is crazy. Just one parameter in your kidney function test, maybe the potassium is too high. Cancelled completely. We see you in three months or something like pregnancy, that morning of surgery, do a urine and this, you're gone. Go, go, so you're going home. We've said so much. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Chidema, so I, I want to ask you the final question, which is in two parts. The first is age. Is there a good age? Is there an age that you wouldn't touch for this type of surgery? And then maybe to round up, what would you what would your advice be when people are looking for safe practitioners to choose from? Okay, so first for age, indeed we are seeing a lot of young, younger people, but mm. if someone is below 18. And yes, they are there. They they want to. They're already in university. Where Sometimes, do they have the money? Oh, young people have money. I don't know how. Wow. I don't know how. <laughs> yes. So if the person is below 18, of course it's a no, unless the mother is there. Okay. So yes, we have mothers come with their children. Yes. We wow. have yes, we have mothers For come. BBL. With their, Yes. Wow. We have daughters bring their moms too. Like my mom, she says she's meant to do this. And we have daughters like, they are bullying her in school. How does she look like this? Please, let's do something about it. So, wow. yeah. So if there's a parent, it's like, that's for like me, a topic for another day. For is, me, yeah. the cutoff is somehow 20. 
Okay. But if there's a parent or a senior person, I've had like that 22, 23 year old. I would like to talk to an older sibling or someone. Yes. Okay. Older brother or someone. So that someone else knows you're about to okay. do this serious thing. Okay. It, you can't be just private, private. You're not that. So so we've seen from 19, 18 year olds all the way to late 40s. The oldest patient I've seen in my time working with other surgeons, foreign surgeons is 63 okay. for liposuction. Okay. But majorly the age bracket is from that 19, the hot age is 23. Yeah. I don't know what happens at 23. No, we were talking about 23 yeah. to 43, between 43 and 45. That's the hot age group we're past it for me. these procedures. Oh, no, you're... Oh. Mm, Sorry, to what, 40? 43, 45, 45. Is the cutoff. Yes. I'm still at... What do you mean? <laughs> so 23 to... But we can see younger people, they're okay. just 21, 22, 20. And, the, and you will see the reason why they need to... They're so big. They could pass for 32-year-olds. Okay. So you will understand that, oh, this person needs to get in shape. Then the second question you mm -hmm. asked me about people um, looking to... For practitioners here in the country, a lot of us are doing our best because they always say anything in Nigeria, there's no... These, a lot of us are doing our best. So I'll say be patient in your research and decision making. Okay. Ask questions. Do not feel, will I say, shy or don't mm -hmm. feel the person is too intimidating. If the person mm -hmm. doesn't have your time, is talking too quick, does not give me, fine, you know that, okay, maybe you may check somewhere else. That mm -hmm. no, Most times, no response or lack of a response is a response. If, yes. if there's something that shouldn't be adequate, is a response. You can make an inference from that. So please be patient. Take three to six months. Go through all the clinics. Don't just look for gossip and clout because you will find it. Mm -hmm. Look for facts. Look for, well, I say, statistics. And when you're sitting in a consultation room with a practitioner, as respectfully and diplomatically as you can, ask the right questions. Am I the right candidate? What are the things that could go wrong? If this happens, what is your response? Have you had this, this and this? How did you handle it? Oh, I read about this or saw this on the news about you. What happened? What's happened to the clinic? The person will answer you within the confines of confidentiality. They will tell you, if it were me, I would be as open as I can within the confines of mm. confidentiality. Then you make a decision. This three to six months gives you time to quit smoking, quit staying around smokers, which is the same thing. Stop taking alcohol. Stop taking, there are some things that are blood thinners or predispose you to blood clotting. Your, your surgeon should educate on that. It gives you time to prepare. There's the four Ps. Pray, plan, prepare, proceed. So you do all these things and I believe you should have a good outcome. And when in doubt, you can just leave it alone. Don't do it. You can Fantastic. leave it. Some people call me and say, change my dates. Change my dates. I've just spoken to someone and revealed this date to the person. And we listen to those things. It's not because it's scientifically proven or anything, but this is Africa. We'll be like, mm, let's see if we can move you within this bracket it's not always easy no i i i i believe i you, believe you, that you i believe that to. if you have a spiritual mm -hmm. thing that you you it's even yes. psychological because yes. i think if a yes. patient isn't ready psychologically yes you're already going yeah. in yeah. with yeah. a risk factor in absolutely there. Yeah. So, dr chidima i know we have to let you go but there is something that has been burning at the back of my mind okay why did you do liposuction and bbl i really want to know I'm, because i've been so <laughs> open about my yeah I really want yes. to know okay so it was the COVID period I was indoors I was eating a lot I ate I ate I, do, I don't know what was going on <laughs> you were not you're not you alone, were not alone. <laughs> <laughs> you're not alone comfort I, 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 I developed a relationship with food there are different things I eat for different emotions to feel good so as I was doing that I lost my midsection I was really close to a hundred kg. Mm -hmm. I think the cutoff for me was 95. When I saw that, okay, I was weighing 95 and I was in, in, in another two weeks, I would hit hundred. I told myself that 
it was time to do something about this. So then I remember my sister and her friends, they would laugh at, at me. I would jog around. All those things were my preparation because mm. I knew I would do surgery. I already had a brand called Covey Girl and then I had a big tummy. All of them are curves though, but I, <laughs> so I now started preparing. I lost a little bit of weight, then went into my surgery, maybe 2 kg only because it's not everybody that has the energy mm. to work out. Then went in for my surgery and during the period of recovery and all, I lost a total of 10 kg wow. and came back to 85. Not because liposuction is for weight loss, but because mm. it stressed me. It was surgery. Some people I can't take all the stress. I wasn't eating well. It was it was stressful, the recovery for me. So and it's not because there was anything wrong with the surgery. Mm. Some people can't take it. Delivery like this, some people are in and out. Others are lying down for another two weeks mm. and mother-in-laws and people are taking care of them. So for me, it was tough. Mm. And but after I lost that weight, I told myself I won't let myself go mm. again. So I do this intermittent fasting. I skip jump rope. Even if I don't have all the time to hit the gym, I watch it so that I will not have to go through that stress again. again. Okay. So sometimes doing plastic surgery welcomes you to taking yourself serious. Don't let yourself go again. Since it wasn't that easy. So that's Fantastic. why I did it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yes. you very much. Thank you for being a yeah. wonderful guest, for being so Thank open you. and for Thank educating and informing our audience. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for me so Thank much as always. Thanks for having me. It's been Thank fantastic. You. All right. We're at the end of another episode where I get to answer your hair care questions. So this one says, Dear Titi, are all protective hairstyles protective? Because I swear, my hair breaks every time I do a protective hairstyle. Interesting question. The answer is, I think that we have overestimated how much protective hairstyles can actually help with our hair health. So I usually go by my three E's. So the first is, is the, is the hairstyle easy on your scalp? Is it easy on your hairstyle? And is it easy to take down? If those answers, if you can answer those questions in the affirmative, which is yes, then perhaps it's the right and protective hairstyles for you. However, this question is a bit nuanced because we're all individuals and what one hair can take, another hair might not be able to take it. So I noticed that I can't take tiny braids anymore. So yes, a lot of people say that is a protective hairstyle, but it doesn't work for me. I can't take it. Even threading, sometimes my hair can't take. So you need to really understand your hair. You need to understand what works for your hair and what doesn't work. If the protective hairstyles you're doing is leading to breakage, that is already telling you that it is not right for you. So find the right ones that's suitable for your own hair. Not all protective hairstyle is actually healthy for your own unique individual strands. Mm -hmm.